Okay, so now let's go to this issue of disciplining the elders. How do we discipline the elders? Uh, and how do we reward the elders? 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. 1 Timothy chapter 5, 17 to 20. 20. Sister Ronke, uh, a, a, please, can you kindly read that for us? 1 Timothy chapter 5, 17 to 20. Sorry, um, just a minute. My trying to right. put off my computer uh, to, to maximize. First Timothy five. Sorry. Yes, please. Seventeen Which to twenty. Seventeen to twenty. Thank you. It says the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For, for, this, for scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain, and the, work, and the worker deserves his wages. Do not uh, entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by uh, two or three witnesses. But those elders, who has who has seen him, you are to reprove uh, before everyone so that the others may take warning. Thank you very much. And if you can add 21 to it, please. 21. I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and to do nothing out of favoritism. Okay, thank you so much. So that's how we are to deal with the elders in areas that require discipline and areas that require reward. Uh, let's take the issue of discipline first. Um, because of their special positions, the scriptures prescribe very clear guidelines, both for the discipline of elders and for their reward. And our emphasis is on their special positions because these are the leaders of the church. These are the final authority now. So whatever they do affects the whole church. So if they do wrong, it affects the church. If they do right, it affects the church. Uh, and, uh, and so there's clear prescription of how we are to handle issues that concern regard to, to discipline, accusations against elders are not to be taken lightly, all right? So uh, you can't just come and accuse an elder uh, and, and that will be that, and then you expect that you will be disciplined, okay? Uh, the scripture says here that the accusation must be corroborated, first of all, all right, there must be witnesses, all right? Uh, um, verse 19, do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses, okay? So when one person comes and accuses an elder, you don't take action against him. You don't even call him to come and defend himself. Uh, you wait until there is corroboration. There is that there, there must be two or or three witnesses. Aha! Uh -huh. Then you know that this matter is real. Uh, why do we say that? Because when you are in leadership, uh, there could be jealousy. There could be you know pettiness by other people, and so uh, there could be a tendency for people to bring frivolous accusations now so when it is not uh, corroborated 
then you treat it as frivolous and you don't press on. But where it is uh, coming from more than one person, uh, then you have a responsibility to uh, take action. Uh, where the, the allegation is proven that discipline should be in public so as to serve as a deterrent to others. So that's what it says uh, in verse 20. But those elders who are sinning, you are to reprove before everyone so that the others may take warning. And I, I take it that by saying those who are sinning, it means that they are not taking correction. They are continuing to do wrong. Uh, and so uh, it says that um, uh, that to be reproved before everyone. So you don't take it and say, oh, this is an elder. So we, can, we will go and hide the give him some punishment, but in, in, in quietness so that he does, no, 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 no. You do it publicly uh, so that other people will know that this, you know, you, you just don't do that in, in here. And so if you can discipline an elder, then everybody else must take correction. But where you tend to favor the elder, that's why I said you should read verse 21. You know, he says, I charge you in the sight of God and of Christ Jesus and the elect uh, angels to keep these instructions without partiality and do nothing out of favoritism. Okay. So you don't say, ah, no, ah, no, 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 no. This elder is a fantastic teacher. If we discipline him now, you know, people, how will people respect him again? And that kind of, you are becoming partial. Okay. You are manifesting favoritism but it should be firm and clear and public. All right. When they serve well, on the other hand, elders are to be rewarded. All right. In verse 17, he says, the elder who directs the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those who work in preaching and teaching, all right? Well, why does he say, especially those who work in preaching and teaching? Uh, it's because uh, these people tend to be those who make this a full-time job, okay? Elders who, in addition to uh, the work they do, uh, uh, in, in, in the area of teaching, uh, also preaching, and also serving as elders. Can you notice that they're both ministers, they have ministry in the church, and at the same time, they're laboring as elders. Uh, that will tend to preoccupy them, that will tend to take their full time, all right? Uh, and he's saying that obviously everybody needs to eat. And if these people cannot walk, uh, elsewhere to any living because they are serving the church in this dual role of eldership and ministry, then they are, they are uh, due for recompense. And the Bible calls it here double honor. And the implication is that uh, you not only say well done to them and respect them, that is one honor, but you also give them a stipend, something uh, <clears throat> on which they can live, all right? Uh, and I don't know whether I will mention this when we talk about financing the local church, uh, which will come up soon. Uh, but let me just say now that this idea of payment does not mean that we'll make them super rich and uh, make them, you know, uh, no, the idea is they should have an average life, all right? Uh, like that of an average person in the community in which they serve. So if it's a community of very, very rich people, well then for them to be, to have an average life like everybody else in the community, you should 
pay them something to that extent. If it is somebody in the village uh, and everybody is living a village life, then you pay them accordingly, you know, uh, so that they will not be uh, looked down upon. Uh, at the same time, you are not trying to make them super rich people. Uh, that's not the purpose of ministry. Okay, of course, I know we will ask questions about some of this as we go on. But as I said, when we deal with financing the local church, we'll also talk more about this. All right. So let, let's go now to the ministry of the deacons uh, for the rest of our time today. The ministry of the deacons is directed towards the meeting of the material needs of the members of the local church. Now, when we say material needs, they, are, they come in two forms. One will be the material needs of the church as a community, as a body. For example, they, they meet in a hall. That hall needs maintenance. That hall needs uh, provision. Uh, like with electricity, uh, uh, you know, and with uh, water, with uh, uh, refreshment systems, and so on and so forth. Uh, all those things that are not spiritual, uh, that the body as a whole needs uh, in some places, they will have, the community will have to be paying uh, some dues. For instance, you may have to pay tax for the land where you where your church is and, and so on and so forth. The people who take care of this, uh, and then of course, again, the, there's collection of money. The people who take care of all of these things are the, uh, are the deacons. And that is to take away uh, from the responsibilities of elders and ministers so that elders and ministers can concentrate on spiritual issues. It doesn't mean that these material issues are not important. They're just as important as spiritual needs are. Uh, and so we have to set apart some people to take responsibility for them. The second part of the material needs of the body of Christ is that of the individual members. Individual members have material needs. And it's the responsibility of the church as a community to take care of the material needs of one another. And the people who take care, who take responsibility in this area are the deacons. Again, so as to divert uh, work from the elders and the ministers so they can focus on things that are spiritual in nature. So it's kind of a division of labor. Now, while the elders and the, and the ministers are responsible for spiritual uh, management of the church, the elder, I mean, the deacons are responsible for the material and physical management of the affairs of the church. Uh, so because the elders, of course, will be too busy, managing the spiritual things, we, we hand over this aspect to the deacons. All right. As a result, the elders have to appoint people to take care of these needs. So when the apostle is still there, when the church planter is still there, it's his responsibility to appoint deacons as well. But when he has left, the responsibility reverts to that of the elders. Okay, um, Acts chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Sister Ayanda Uche, please, can you read for us? Uh, Acts chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Uh, good evening. Good evening, evening, sister. Bless you. Acts chapter 6, 
Yes, please. Verse 1 to 2. Now, about this time, when the number of disciples was increasing, a complaint was made by the Hellenists against the Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve called the disciples together and said, It is not appropriate for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables and manage the distribution of foods. Of food. Okay. Thank you very much. So you see, yes, sir, the, you. the cause or the rationale for the appointment of deacons uh, in the first instance here, all right? It's interesting that um, uh, the, um, uh, what do you call them? The, um, the Hellenics uh, and the Hebrews, we're having conflict in the church, all right? Because they are the widows of these Hellenistic Jews were being neglected in the distribution of relief. Uh, I hope you recall that uh, because of the nature of the origin of the church in Jerusalem, people came, people were there who were caught up in that initial move that became the church, that, that they, they came there from different parts of the world. Actually, they initially came as pilgrims, as Jewish pilgrims. They didn't come to stay and live in Jerusalem. They didn't know the Holy Spirit would be visiting, and they did not know that they were going to uh, hear the gospel and, and be converted to Christianity. So they didn't come to live in, in permanently in Jerusalem. They, they must have brought food with them uh, and or money uh, for, for the pilgrimage. But that was just to last them for the duration of the pilgrimage. And then came the Holy Spirit. And then came Peter preaching. And so many of them got converted. Thousands of them got converted, as you recall, when we, where we were read in Acts 2. And when they got converted, they, they, there were thousands of them from different parts of the world. Uh, 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 and um, most of them came from places where Jews, and they were all Jews, of course. And that's why they came to Jerusalem for pilgrimage. But they, they, they came speaking the languages. They were also speaking the languages of the places where they resided. So when they came to Jerusalem, totally unprepared for the long-term stay that they ended up experiencing a situation arose where there wasn't enough food, you know. Uh, uh, and so uh, those who lived in Jerusalem, that's why they began to sell their houses and, uh, and sell their property and bring in the money to be feeding these people who were, who were more like... Uh, I won't call them refugees, uh, but they were caught up in this move of God, this initial move of God that resulted in the first church in Jerusalem. Uh, and they began to live in Jerusalem, uh, totally without uh, the necessary financial backing to do so. So when that situation arose, uh, the, the apostles, who were the ones who were doing all the sharing of food, and they were the ones who were preaching, they were the ones who were teaching. So it wasn't, uh, how do I put it? It wasn't surprising that uh, they didn't do it very well. And so some people were being neglected naturally, because if, if you are giving food, you give to those you know. And then they didn't give to those they didn't know. All these people who came from Greece and from Cyprus and from Malta and all those places. They were not getting food. Uh, and so they complained. And in order to resolve the matter, this office of Dickens was created. So now we wouldn't wait until such situations arise in our own churches before we now imitate these brethren. We have seen clearly that this thing was a solution to a problem that will naturally arise anyway. So we want to solve it before it arises by appointing elders before this kind of problem arises 
in the church that we are planting. All right. So now what will be the qualifications that will be required for the office of the elder? One Timothy, I mean of the deacon, one Timothy chapter three, verses eight to 12. One Timothy chapter three, verses eight to 12. Sister Pastor Juliet, Juliet, can you read for us? One Timothy chapter three, verses eight to 12. Pastor Juliet, are you there? Okay, Pastor Juliet doesn't seem to be there. So let um, Brother Pumalanga, can you please read for us? First Timothy chapter three, verses eight to 12. First Timothy chapter three, three, and verse three, verse eight, eight to twelve. Mm, church, church helpers must also have a good character and be sincere. They must not drink too much wine or be greedy for money. They should hold to the revealed truth of the faith with a clear conscience. They should be tested first. And then, if they pass the test, they are to serve. Their wives also must be of good character and must not gossip. They must be sober and honest in everything. A church helper must have only one wife and be able to manage his children and family well. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, um, he calls them church helpers, right? Um, uh, uh, that to what translation is that, Malanga? It's the Holy, English. Holy Bible, English Bible. Okay, all right. Now it's a modern version, and the idea is to demystify the term. Deacon, because it's not an original English word. It just took the Greek word and anglicized it. Uh, and uh, diakonos, and it calls it deacons. Uh, so to make it clearer what he's talking about, they translated it in that translation as church helpers that are really deacons that they're talking about, right? So he says they are to be worthy of respect, Sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. All right, these are some of the qualities or characteristics that require to be people in whose life there is a clear evidence of the presence of the Spirit of God. Okay, um, and uh, we saw this in chapter six of Acts of the Apostles. Uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what uh, the apostles told them. Choose men who are filled with the Holy Spirit. And this might sound surprising since the ministry is essentially to serve table. You do, you, it may not seem as if uh, it is necessary to be filled with the Holy Spirit uh, in order to serve tables. However, it must be realized that effectiveness in material work requires spiritual qualities, right? Uh, what we're saying here is that when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, it will affect every aspect of your life, including your even your job, how you do your job. Okay, so it's not surprising, therefore, that those who are supposed to lead in the in the uh, material care of the church should also be required to be people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Indeed, in the light of the, that requirement mentioned above, it is clear that the characteristics needed for the office of the deacon is not different from those of the elder. So if you read uh, that portion I would just read, you see that it's not much different, uh, the characteristics that are required of elders and those that we are required of, of uh, deacons. In the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect. The other one we saw that they, are, they were to be without blemish. It's the same thing, sincere, not indulging in much wine uh, and not pursuing dishonest gain, right? So these people are to still be doing their business, but their business, in their business, they must not be pursuing dishonest gain. They shouldn't be selling contraband and uh, uh, drugs and stuff like that. No, no, no. It must be people who are pursuing honest gain. All right. They must keep hold of, uh, of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. All right. So they must know the truths of the faith and obey it. They, they must first be tested. That, that's the only difference between the elders and the deacons. In the case of the elder, you watch out for those characteristics and you appoint them once and for all. In the deacons, you, can, you appoint people deacons uh, uh, and watch them, give them a probation so that you can see whether they, uh, they are fit for that position. Uh, so you appoint them maybe for a year or six months in the first instance, and then you watch them and uh, check out whether they are capable of doing the work that they have been called to do. Okay, and then it talks about their women. Some people call it their wives. Other people say deaconesses. In other words, those of among them who are women. And you recall that uh in the last discussion we were discussing whether elders could be women and we said we concluded that elders would be men but here we see that deacons can be men or women all right uh, but they must be worthy of respect uh, not malicious talkers but temperate and trustworthy in every way right a deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and household well. The same thing uh, with the elder. Those who have served well, okay, we'll talk about that in a minute, but we'll talk about their remuneration. Okay, the church planter has the responsibility for the appointment of deacons while he remains in the church. After his departure, that responsibility reverts to the elders, All right? However, whether it is the church planter who is appointing them, or it is the elder who is uh, 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 elders who are appointing them, uh, it seems important from the biblical perspective uh, that uh, reference should first be made to the church members for their recommendation. And we see we see this in Acts chapter one, uh, chapter six, verses one to six that we read earlier, where the apostles told them to appoint men who have who were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they gave the characteristics of their lives, and then they said, uh, "Choose from among yourself these men." All right. So the appointment of the uh, of the deacons will be done eventually or ultimately by the apostle church planter or by the elders. But he does so by seeking the participation of the people, all right? Remember, this is not the case with the eldership. This is the case only with the deacons, where right? ask the people to participate. They select the people and bring them to you. You check them, you appoint them pro term. That is to say, you put them on a probation and you watch them. Uh, and only when they pass, do you then confirm them. But it starts with the people bringing the recommendation in the first place. And that is because 
as those whose needs will be served by the deacons, that is to say their material needs are to be served by these deacons. It's important that they should have confidence in the officials who will serve to meet those needs. So these deacons who are going to serve us, we, the ordinary people, must have confidence in them. And when we participate in their selection, it is more likely than not that we will have confidence in them. Secondly, as the people from among whom the officials are to be appointed, they will probably have a better knowledge of their true standing as Christians than would the church planter or the elder. I'm thinking of the situation with the apostles in Jerusalem, 5,000 members in their church. How are they going to know the people to appoint? They don't know all the people, but the people themselves know them themselves. They know one another, and they know those who will fit the bill. So give them the qualities that are required. Let them select these people, appoint them on a probationary basis, watch over them, and then confirm those who are worthy of appointment. All right. There are duties. Uh, first of all, there will be the material care of, of the church members. The deacons are expected to lead in making sure that the physical structures needed for the members' meetings and functioning are in place. Okay? So the structure of the church, that the church building is well maintained, as I said before, okay, that the bills are paid, that, uh, uh, you know, that, that they don't get thrown away or thrown out uh, 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 by the landlord if they are renting the place or by the council because they've not paid their council tax, uh, as the case may be, that, that should be the function of the Dickens, okay? Uh, the money that is collected is, is well accounted for and is banked appropriately, accounts kept properly, and all of that. Uh, as such, they are to be responsible for maintenance, payment of bills, security, protocol, uh, you know, like I said, finance, uh, and all other things necessary to ensure that the functioning of the body without disruption or stress are in place. All the things that are required. So if, if the wind blows off one sheet from the roof, it's the deacons who run around. Uh, the pastor and the, I mean, the elders and the ministers are not concerned with that kind of stuff, you know, um, uh, and so on and so forth. All right, so that's one area. We're talking about the church, as a body, as a group, but then also the care for the needy as individuals. Next in importance only to the spiritual needs of the believers are their physical and social needs. Many, many churches don't bother about this. They just come and they preach to the people, they seek to attend to their spiritual needs, and that's that. Whether they eat or they don't eat, whether they wear clothes or they don't wear clothes, what, whether their houses are clean or dirty, whether their environment is well kept or not, is none of the concern of the church. But that is not correct. It's the responsibility of the church to take care of that whole person, not just their spiritual life, but the whole person, right? Uh, so, and it's the Dickens who take care of these other areas. Indeed, failure to recognize or pay attention to these material areas of need will have a negative impact on the efforts on their spiritual lives, right? It is therefore a very important duty of the Dickens uh, that are called upon to perform these functions in the local church. So, we are saying that when somebody has not eaten and you're preaching about a holiness, he's not paying attention to what you're talking about. His stomach is troubling him, right? So the church needs to pay attention to that kind of thing. What are your people? Do they eat? 
Do they wear clothes? Do they have they paid their rent? You know, uh, are their children in school? Have they paid the school fees of their children? All those material areas of life uh, and workout systems whereby all these type of needs will be met on a routine and a regular basis. That's the responsibility of the deacons. The specific areas of their concern will include the food, clothing, health, educational needs, environmental needs uh, of the members. Again, as I said, we will discuss this in a minute. It is a meeting of these needs that the deacons are called upon to provide. That's their job as uh, deacons. Of course, they are not expected to meet these needs from their own resources, right? Their job is to lead the church in meeting the needs of one another. So it is to, to find ways of getting the church as a body, that is to say, uh, uh, together to uh, seek to meet these areas of needs of one another. I think we will we'll stop here for today and then uh, see how we go with the discussions. Back to you, David. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for taking us through this very important uh, organization of the church and how it must function. Want to open this time to questions and contributions if there are any. Why people are preparing their questions? So I, I think uh, what can we say qualifies a person to be a member of the church and to be cared for without just having unnecessary, adding unnecessary burdens to the body of Christ? People who just come to church, they have no commitment in any way, but they expect welfare from the church. Okay, I think we have already said how people who have uh, many months ago dealt with how we become members of the church. We talked about evangelism. Uh, we talked about discipleship. Uh, uh, in fact, we talked about a kind of pre-church situation where we are uh, ministering to, to them in groups in the evangelistic stage. Uh, these are not yet members of the church, right? But once people are baptized, and they are the, the Bible talks of, talks of them as being added to the church, right? Uh, uh, and uh, they're baptized, they're involved in discipleship, in ongoing discipleship. These are recognized as being members of the church. That's how I would define it. Yes, sir. And uh, in cases of parachurch ministries, what would be the structure like? I don't know what you mean by parachurch ministries. Okay. We're talking <laughs> about church here now. So I think you understand. <laughs> we're, yeah. we're talking about church. <laughs> we're to, so we're, we are I think as a body concerned as... here with church. About... Okay. <laughs> All right. Church planters, let's speak, please. <laughs> <laughs> there's a how there's a hand from uh, Flockhouse Institute, the school. Do you know who is speaking? Good evening, good sirs. You're yes. speaking to Peño. Peño, good evening. Peño, go ahead. I think they're having challenges there. Oh, okay. Um, I, I heard you speak on the discipline of the elders, so elders and who takes into account when they see discipline, how to do it. Thank you. That's it. So David, did you get that? Peña, Peña you, may, uh, you may say it again. It was cutting. We couldn't get you. I was asking if... As, as you mentioned that the elders are to be disciplined when there is more than one or two accounts, 
of um, offenses. Yes. Who takes into account or holds the account of the wrongs of the elder and who disciplines them and how are they disciplined? Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, the when anybody offends in the church, whether it's an elder or is a floor member, he is to be reported to the other elders. Yeah, so if an elder offends, I seek out the other elders. Now, if it's not the normally, once you have a group of people, there'll be one who will be their leader. At least he will be the one calling them to meetings. He'll be the one uh, organizing them. Doesn't make him superior to any of the others, but he's their leader in the sense of uh, administration. Now, that kind of person would be normally the person you will report to. Um, uh, then if he is the one who is guilty, then you report to any of the others, uh, any of the other elders. And when we deal with them uh, according to scripture, we will do it. So for example, we'll, we will consider the matter when there are two or three witnesses. When he's considered and he's found to be genuinely guilty, then he is to be disciplined publicly, openly. Uh, uh, and you were asking what kind of discipline to depend on what the situation is what the offense is. The more severe the offense, the more serious the discipline. Uh, but initially, from, from that scripture, the initial approach will be to seek to correct the person. Because what the scripture says, there's those who keep on sinning, those who continue. In other words, you have warned them, you have told them that you don't do this. You're an elder. This is a very serious matter. And please stop, all right? And he doesn't, and he continues. Then he is to be brought before the church openly. And the matter will be raised before the church. His offense should be mentioned to the whole church. And he is to be reprimanded before the whole church. Uh, and to me, that will imply that at least for some time, he should step down as a leader until he takes correction, okay? Thank you, sir. Any more questions or comments? Somebody speaking. Yes, there's someone approaching to ask the question. Okay, from the school. Yes. Okay. Um, good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening, Lerato. It's Lerato. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, okay, I would like to ask a question, but I would like to read from verse 3, First Timothy chapter 3, from verse 3 to, to 5. It says, not giving to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? <clears throat> so my focus is on verse five. I would like to ask a question to say, because many a times you'd find that the parents are in Christ, right? But then the children are not. So my question is that how do we, how do the parents go about bringing the kids along with them in the journey? What right. is the right way of doing? <laughs> All right. Um, we did teach, uh, a, a short series on the disciple and his home. Uh, I guess maybe you were not yet in school at the time we did that. Um, David, we have to dis discuss this whole idea of 
uh, how to serialize these things for for the school, particularly because the school is Keeps not changing. permanent. Yes. Mm. So there are people who have not done some necessary courses that they need to do. Okay, so a, a example is a very important aspect of child upbringing that you model what you expect them to be like. Uh, uh, the second very important thing is prayer, that you keep praying for them seriously, sincerely, and consistently that God will touch them and bring them to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The third thing is correction. And when they then do wrong or go wrong, you need to seriously and clearly correct children. Uh, but you, don't, you do so in a manner that does not frighten them off or a manner that does not make them feel that you hate them and you're punishing them. In other words, corrections should not necessarily be punitive, but should be in such a way that people uh, understand. You correct him, you let him understand what scriptures he has offended, how he has how what he's doing is impacting on his relationship with God. You get him to take it spiritually, get him to repent, uh, so that even when you punish him, he sees that this is in the line of bringing him back to spirituality. Uh, so those that that's how I'll summarize how you can bring up your children in a way that will make them uh, uh, obedient uh, in the manner being talked about here in verse 5. Okay? Does that help? Sister Lerato? Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, yeah, God okay. bless you. Thanks. Sister Yanda? Thank you. Good evening, Mikhail. Good evening, Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Pastor. Um, I, I wanted to uh, find out um, if there, there is a um, prescription from the scriptures uh, on how many elders you can appoint, um, okay. deaconess, uh, deacons you can appoint, that's, that's number one. And then number two, how soon can you appoint elders when you you've planted a, a, a church? Right. Okay, thank you. Very good questions. Uh, and, the first one is I I I do not have any scripture to to talk about numbers. However, uh, because of of what the scripture talks about, we can definitely say it will be more than one per church. Okay because it talks about them in plural terms. Uh, so we, uh, we know that it won't be one person. Uh, so it, must, it may be two, three, four, five. Again, depending on the numerical strength, A, of the ministers in the church, because that to be, you don't get, you don't appoint five people to be leading two ministers when there are only two ministers in the church. All right. So, it will be commensurate with the number of ministers and the numerical strength of the church. That's all I can say at this time uh, or uh, in connection with that particular question. In connection with the other question of, uh, what was that again? Um, not numbers, but yes, uh, when, at what point? Uh, what I, I can make reference to is a scripture that says that elders should not be new converts, all right? Uh, and so you don't appoint them when they are new converts. You wait, they grow, they grow in discipleship, they grow in spirituality, uh, they grow in maturity. Then uh uh, uh, you can then appoint them. So uh, uh, it's not something to be done in a hurry at all. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Suche. Any more questions or comments? Who is under Dima? Dima. Hello, Dima. Hello, Pastor. It's just Amanda here. Oh, <laughs> I think that that's great, it's Amanda. What would you ask? Since uh, this is your heartbeat, you you are like a deaconess who takes care of people and helps communities. Any question or comment? Are you okay, Hmm? Okay, I didn't get you. So anyway, so I think part of what you dealt with, um, looking at Dickens' responsibility is mostly within the church. Uh, would they have functions as, as it relates to communities? The church ministering to the needs of communities where they exist. Um, the, yeah, I need to point out that generally speaking, uh, our primary focus is on on the church itself. Um, um, where there is community uh, function f uh, from the church. Um, it should be that we are a doing a public relations role, more or less, because we're really uh, doing this uh, 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 in terms of our relationship with them to keep up a good relationship uh, because of neighborliness <laughs> in the first place. Uh, secondly, uh, where there are uh, evangelistic um, opportunities to be derived from that kind of a thing, then it becomes part of our evangelism. Okay. So for example, there are instances where there have been community care in terms of, for example, setting up schools or healthcare provision mm. for the community. Uh, and this gives an opportunity to preach the gospel yeah. okay and to present just, Christ uh, that should be seen in that context um, rather than uh, what I don't want to see is a situation where Christians and the churches see it as a mandatory duty to do these municipal tasks you know, mm. uh, as though uh, uh, that's our job. Mm. Uh, our primary assignment is to preach the gospel. Uh, that's our primary assignment to the community, spiritual. But sometimes there are actual needs that we can meet, help meet. If there are, we should help meet them naturally. All right. Uh, I mean, mm. for example, there is genuine hunger in the community where you live. And there is the means from the church to help in that area. Of course, we don't close our eyes to the needs of our neighbors. The Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? So mm -hmm. we help. But wherever we do that, we need to be looking at our evangelism, you know, because that's, that's really what we're called to do, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so whatever we do in, uh, outside of that must be related. To evangelism. Yeah. So, saying so these two structures <clears throat> um, of church church function, you have elders and ministers yes. as uh, spiritual leaders, yes. and then you have deacons and deaconesses as material yes. leaders of the body. Uh, in terms of accountability, should the deacons account to elders at some point? Um, I would think I would think that is absolutely necessary. Okay. 
uh, um, uh, let me put it that way, of ensuring probity. You will see in Paul's writings that uh, whether he's talking about individuals or he's talking about churches, he, he often emphasizes the need for probity, that you are, you are honestly, sincerely accountable for what material things you are charged with. Okay? So for example, when he was taking relief to Jerusalem, mm. he ensured that he didn't take it alone. He appointed a group of people to go with him, you know, and the idea is when they come back, they can account to the churches that this thing you gave also to deliver in Jerusalem, it was actually delivered. delivered. Paul did not take it alone and say, no, no, you can trust me, I'm, I'm a leader. Yeah, He always wanted to manifest probity. Okay, mm. so whatever we can do, uh, and this is because of human nature. Human nature is such that it's easily corruptible, you know. Uh, and many times you don't even intend to be corrupted in the first instance. There mm. might be some genuine reasons why you Temptations. want to do what you want to do. Uh, some necessities arose, so I just took the money from here to do that. Unfortunately, there's something when I was going on the way, mm. uh, some people snatched the money from me and that kind of thing. Uh, you're in mm. trouble already because... Uh, you didn't have the right to take the money in the first place. So we must have structures in place to safeguard one another from such human failures, frailties, and accidents. Okay? okay. So uh, uh, whatever structure can be built should be built uh, to ensure accountability. I think basically the, the Dickens should build that structure among themselves, be accountable first and foremost to themselves, okay? And then occasionally, like you said, you know, or periodically, they should then generally account to the elders. That's the way I think it should go. So in the case where um, a deacon honestly lost, say, money, mm -hmm. uh, he, he, should, he should just find some ways to pay it back without really? No, not necessarily. For example, if it was money given to him officially and formally and properly, all right? Mm. And he went as he was going on the way, thieves snatched the money attacked. from him, yeah. all right? Mm. Of course, you mm. can't expect him to be paying that back, that type of thing. That would be wrong. The church has lost money, all right? Uh, uh, as a community, it shouldn't be the individual that should be taxed for that. But what I was getting at is we must not allow situations that will permit individuals to have access to church funds so that they are tempted to take it with the hope of coming to pay back tomorrow. You know, mm -hmm. uh, can I, you know, I have a need, let me quickly take this money and use it for this. I, I'll bring it back. Uh, we must create a system that does not permit anyone to do that because it's a very dangerous thing. And the devil loves to exploit that type of situation. He will just mm. disgrace you uh, uh, when you honestly had good intentions to begin with. Mm. So in, now we, we read that a deacon should be, um, should be put under probation, tested. Yes. Right. Are there a few examples you'd like to give us on how this testing could take place? Oh, it's just probation. You allow him to do the work, or you allow them to do the work, and you watch how they're doing it. Mm. All right. Uh, like, were, the case, were the case where one brother all the time, the change never comes back to you? Something is missing, something happened, and he has to use uh, well, it. He has failed his probation. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah it cannot be appointed mm. all right thank you so very much sir for bless you us. thank you god bless you may the lord continue to strengthen you uh so we want to come to the end of our study today and uh, just be patient we we'll share one more song and then somebody will pray for us and we'll close the meeting for today. All right, I would like to ask um, 
Sister Ayanda Uche to pray for us. Then we take the Lord's blessing for tonight and we'll close. Lord, we so thankful, Lord God, my Father, tonight for caring for us, oh Lord God, loving us so much. Precious Lord God, my Father, not leaving us the way that we are, but coming to us and appearing to us, oh Lord, revealing yourself, Almighty God, to us, opening our eyes, Lord, removing the veil, Gurungulu, by your spirit. We give you all the glory and all the honor and all the adoration. Precious Lord, forgive us, O oh Lord God, for doing things in the wrong way, doing things not according to your word, O oh God. In Jesus' name, we ask that, Lord God, my Father, you would help us to not only hear, what, listen to what you are saying, but, Lord God, to hear with our hearts and to obey all that you are commanding us, commanding us to do. Go say, I'm in your word, in the name of Jesus. That, Lord God, we will seek to give you, to bring you glory. We will seek, precious Lord God, my Father, to do on Gosiami your will, Almighty God, in the name of Jesus Christ. That, Lord God, we will seek your kingdom first, O Lord God, and your righteousness, my God. We will not seek anything else. Precious Lord God, my Father, that you're not asking us to seek. Lord God, we pray and we ask that, Lord God, my Father, you will help us, even my God, to be the light uh, uh, to, to even uh, other believers that are, are still in the dark. We ask, O oh, precious Lord God, that we will be, that you will help us, O oh, Lord God, my Father, to relay your message, O oh, Lord God, your heart, O oh, Lord God, of how you want the church, O oh, Lord God, my Father, to, the structure of the church to be like on the earth, my Lord, in the name of Jesus. Precious Lord, we thank you. Once again, even for our teachers, oh Lord, we bless your holy name. We ask you that, Lord God, my Father, that you continue being with them, continue strengthening them, continue blessing them, continue lifting them up, oh God, continue to be their glory, my God, Jehovah, in the name of Jesus Christ, and protect them, Lord, in these times, oh God, in Jesus' name, that you provide for all their need, according to your riches and glory, mighty God, in Jesus' name, that you will, as they refresh us, Lord, you will refresh them in the name of Jesus Christ. All to the glory of your name, my Lord. I pray that they will have a renewed strength to, to continue doing your work. That Jehovah, you will encourage in the name of Jesus Christ, O oh God. That they will continue to preserve them until your day, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. So keeping them blameless and spotless, O oh Lord God. And defying their whole spirit. Thank you so much. We thank you for their lives with for their families, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sister Amen. Yanda, for the prayer. I want to Amen. pray that the Lord will heal everyone who is sick and weak in the body in the name Amen. of Jesus. And I want to declare Psalm 27 over you this uh, moment, verse 1 to 3. The Lord mm. is your light and your salvation. Whom shall you fear? The Lord is a stronghold mm. of your life. Of whom shall you be afraid? When the wicked mm. advance against you to devour you, it is your enemies and your foes who will stumble and fall. Though an mm. army besiege you, May, uh, though an army besiege you, your heart will not fear. Though a war break out against you, even then you will be confident. The Lord is your strength. The Lord is your peace. The Lord is your joy. Go forth strong in this week and prevail. And I want to charge you to please try to extend this invitation to other people when you receive it. May the Lord continue to be with us all. Thank you so very much for attending and being faithful to the end. God bless you.